an incubator, I guess I sort of think very much of in the farm stage where you think of sort of the egg and, and sort of allowing that egg to mature so that it's able to hatch. So I sort of think of that very much when I think of uh, electronics. I think of a, a safe place where somebody can uh, explore an idea such that it matures to a point where one can maybe have a minimum viable product or something to demonstrate the practicality of that idea and whether there is a market behind it. So the term often gets jumbled, you know, what is an incubator? What is a co-working space? I think the, the easy way to describe it is a co-working space provides space for a fee and nothing else. Maybe they provide basic services, whereas an incubator is about investing in these companies, giving them the space that need to thrive and having hands-on involvement from the team to help scale and grow the company as well, whether it's from fundraising or strategy or technology. An incubator is really hands-on in terms of helping these companies grow. We have a faculty of engineering at my school, which is really great. It's got lots of resources to use, like soldering workstations, 3D printers, things like that. I think our school is actually a bit unique in how much focus we have on this. I would love makerspaces to be supported and driven more in the schools. What's really important is that there is an output side of it that doesn't get perceived as a hobby, but it gets perceived as a career and a passion that you can go and apply yourself to. Someone like Liam, 10 years ago, wouldn't have had an avenue to, to play with these kinds of ideas and suddenly it's actually realistic for him now to think about all the things that he could do with his technological bent. It doesn't have to be he can only work in software. It's a learning process about the factories and how the manufacturing kind of pipeline works and all that hardware accelerator kind of programs, things like that. I think you do need uh, support structures for anyone to succeed and I refer to it as a complementary skill. You know, I can consider myself to be an inventor, say, but I'm not a marketer, I can't sell things. So you need to have a structure around you that will help you grow your idea. Startups are hard. There are so many pitfalls along the way. A maker's generally not going to have the full resources of a, a corporate entity behind them to go and set up marketing, sales, all those sorts of teams you need. You know, technical dead ends, the, um, commercial issues, crossing commercial and technical chasms. You can't underestimate the power of incubators, not only incubators that, that are helping on the commercial side, but ones that provide access to experts in manufacturing. And I think that's where these spaces become so valuable. Spaces like YBF Ventures, for example, we we can take anyone off the street who is interested in building a company and equip them with what they need to take it to the next level. At our core, I see ourselves as being connectors. We're really good routers in this whole startup scene and corporate scene. So from a business perspective, we help startups here strategize on what they need to do to scale and to grow and to meet the right people as well in corporate Australia and also from investors. We also have a group of really experienced technologists in the areas that we focus on. So we have a group of advisors in the fintech space, people like our chairman, for example, the former CEO of ANZ Bank, Mike Smith, and also in the Web 3.0 spaces, people like Joshua Bursky, the founder of the Distributed Technologies Institute. Where we need additional expertise, we look to our network of people to help fill in the gaps, and we bring them in when startups need advisors and experts to help fill in the gaps. I've seen so many challenges with the attendees of the hacker space actually going and moving ahead, like understanding of what they need to do to move ahead as a business. And someone who can tell you what not to do is often, you've got, there's lots of things you can do, but not a lot of them you wanted. A lot of them you don't want to do. So that's really the foundation of the makerspace and how they connect with the incubator industries, a number of which are in Melbourne and Sydney, and how they help connect with the go-to-market side of things, how to mentor and, and assist people to understand how they could get their ideas and inventions to market, who they can collaborate with to, to really go actually go and move forward with it. They can be advantage, an advantage if you know nothing. The experience there is really valuable. Someone who's done it before, and can guide you through that and provide some manpower. If, you, if you're short-staffed or struggling for just throughput, some extra help is really valuable. Incubators are good for this, but they need to be scaled up in this country at least, where they provide all the infrastructure necessary. We have a few hardware startups here uh, at YBF. It's not our core focus yet, but stay tuned to learn more. If we were able to attach the culture of the hacker space to Inspire 9, York Butter Factory, map a bit more operationally to get the incredible hacker space ideas out into the world and help those teams and groups of collaborators put it together, it would be absolutely wonderful. There was a space called Electron Workshop here that was a dedicated makerspace, which was really great. I think tech in general in Australia tends to ride waves. The wave as of late has been fintech and the waves shifted to cryptocurrencies and distributed technologies. Whether or not IoT will become a wave again, 
that's yet to see, but I think it'd be really great if spaces started focusing on that. And I think that's where the universities also have a strength here in Australia. People like RMIT, they've got maker spaces as well that people can tap into. So it is an underserved area. Yeah, definitely. Someone just needs to go through and list what you need to make a product. If you're serious about making a product, you, you need to have access to good tools. There's, there's no question about that. At the end of the day, it's all about products. Okay, it's about selling something. You have to have a 3D printer. There's the, you cannot make any of this stuff without one. You need a reasonable lathe, a milling machine, and also a set, some sort of CNC mill. Then you can pretty much come up with some decent prototypes at home. So if you've got uh, a good idea for something, someone can help you with the industrial design, someone can help you with regulatory requirements, someone can help you with the manufacturing process, and definitely someone needs to help you sell. And we saw that with X Factory, we saw that with Seed. I generally do think that hardware startups are tougher here in Australia than in the US. A couple of reasons, hardware startups require a lot of capital, a lot of risk capital as well. And we certainly don't have the amount of money that the US has to be able to test things like autonomous vehicles, state-of-the-art, you know, city uh, IoT devices. I think it really highlights that the government needs to do something about this and improve the state of play in Australia. Government involvement in the tech industry is a bit of a tricky question and there are situations where it can be really beneficial and other areas where it can be a problem. As long as there's not someone saying, no, you can't do that, you can do it. I think it depends on the culture, the local culture, the local demographics, who the players are. We've seen government funding, you know, worldwide work and don't work in some contexts. You look at the city of Shenzhen, it's not just private investment, right? It's the government there is, is very active in terms of supporting and setting directions in terms of where they want things to go. A great example of, you know, government funding working is in London. They've heavily funded in Canary Wharf to create the level 39 space and that's been a massive flag for the UK to say this is the centre of fintech. No one can create in a vacuum. There's definitely a huge amount of, you know, ecosystem support that goes into it. And I really struggle to find what the role of government is in that. And that's coming from a startup, so I don't envy the government's role in trying to figure out where they're useful. So there are some initiatives that are in place for smaller companies. They're incredibly hard to use. It's almost impossible. You practically need people dedicated to assisting companies deal with the bureaucracy to actually get any of that to work. The amount of time that it takes and the amount of effort that it takes to actually deal with government bureaucracy in any way that is even slightly useful means that you wouldn't be doing the things that you were trying to do in the first place. Because in a, in a large way, you know, government processes are really long and slow. And so in any interaction with them, whilst incredibly valuable and their support is, is useful, if that's hindered by a lot of red tape and process, that can become almost counterproductive. If you've got all the pieces already in play, if you're a corporate enterprise set up to develop products, you probably don't actually need an awful lot of government's help. Ultimately, you know, I, I don't think that going through incubators, through co-working spaces, through accelerators, I don't think they're the only way of building a company. Certainly you don't necessarily need to raise venture capital money. You do what's best for your business at that point in time. And I think if someone is persistent enough, they will find the right resources to help them grow, whether it's an, it involves the involvement of an incubator or accelerator or not at all. Oh, I believe this is the next business case that's happening. You know, there's money to be made by helping startups. So I think all of this is just a, a thing to make money for other people. I don't think it's really necessary. But at the same time, if you're, if you're helping and you're doing something, something's always better than nothing. Hopefully we'll be able to make good decisions as a society and, and make progress regardless of whether our government understands technology. Technology. Yes, governments absolutely get the value of technology. Uh, also for national defence and national pride, we like to understand how these things work. Mo mostly what government should be doing is uh, understanding what people need and want and enabling that to happen, enable people to, to get on with it, people who do understand technology, be, be it our research departments or industry or so on. I think government has a role to provide a, a platform for people to succeed. I don't necessarily think they need to, to pick winners. And I think a great example of that here in Victoria is our partnership with the Victorian government. You know, there are two fintech hubs out there, YBF Ventures and Stone and & Chalk. We both have our respective strengths and the government's seen through that as well. And they've, they know that we bring different things to the table. So I think that's a, a case of government realizing that there are people in the ecosystem who have worked for a very long time to help advance it. And it's about providing uh, these key players with the resources that you need to create the culture. So I don't think they need to be involved directly. I think they need to empower the community and the people within the community to help elevate the community. Because I think 
communities and ecosystems need to be entrepreneur-led. If Australia wants to be competitive in these areas, we need more incubators. We need more hacker spaces that train people up, that give people introduction to the skills, that give people access to the machines that they you know, wouldn't have access to on their own. We'd love to have a maker space here at some point in the future. I think we're definitely not going to rule that out. You know, areas that we're, we're really interested in, you know, are the really underlying horizontals, you would call them. They're th industry agnostic, and I think you know, hardware is an area that will be industry agnostic in the future as we move to this reinvention of cities and the smart cities concept, biometrics from the human perspective, all the way to you know, the smart home. These are all areas that will have some kind of hardware interface and it'd be great to be a part of that at some point in the future. Most teenagers in high school are simply not aware that they can go and apply themselves in this incredible way. How do we help them be aware? And how do we help them be aware that it's a job, it's a career, it's a passion. You actually love your work all the time as you do it. And you get to make products and build brands and companies that spread all around the world. Grassroots is so important to create the next generation of founders. I wouldn't have been in technology if my dad hadn't been in the tech scene as well. And I'm sure that's a similar story for a lot of people in tech. So I think being able to uncover these opportunities for people when they're extremely young is really important because how else would you foster and grow the interest in engineering, in technology, in science, in medicine? One of the key initiatives that we've been running as of late is Startup Weekend. Startup Weekend is a 54-hour hackathon. Anyone can join from you know a kid in high school all the way up to all the way to people like you know who's just entering technology for the first time so I'm sorry weekend is bringing people together for 54 hours getting them to meet each other for the first time forming companies and having a taste of what it's like to build a company that's that's where government can really give Australian manufacturing a shot in the arm is is to help them with with this kind of access that incubators have during the tour we also went to an Australian startup event or uh, a local startup event in Shenzhen just by chance the Australian government had an Austrade event um, happening in, Ch in Shenzhen on that night so I think they, they put on these nights every now and again. Ho has just mentioned that how the Australian government attaches importance to innovation and actually one of the government's initiatives to promote the development of innovation is to setting up five Australian learning paths across the globe and today we are, we are very lucky actually to have our Shanghai learning pad Manager Daniel Jan. So the the Austrade event was set up as a it's sort of an Australian government partnering initiative where you can say I've got this idea I've got a product I need to get it manufactured and ready and into production and the Austrade group will sort of liaise with you and then help you set up in China and investigate supporting your needs in China. So that that's a helpful initiative. Austrade in particular has various launch pads or their launch pad program, which is actually a global initiative to help startups be able to land in a different country and be able to set themselves up and engage with that ecosystem as quickly as possible. So Shanghai, San Francisco, Singapore, Berlin and Tel Aviv. Who are the landing pads for? So we want to help Australian-founded, market-ready and tech-relevant startups and scale-ups who can demonstrate the capability in the BLOW criteria. So Australian-founded, easy to, to get that, no uh, dispute. Market-ready is the main hurdle we have observed so far, is that we want the uh, startups coming to China to be ready, to be prepared, so with something to offer to the market. Um, obviously. The government, Australian government, is trying to encourage us to uh, to explore that avenue. So they have their landing pads you can actually sort of get help with. So they, they will actually help you set yourself up, which is a great thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. So the Austrade event started with a presentation. And then at the end of that, they, they had a panel of experts, professors of design, one of the co-founders of Hacks, which is an accelerator. I think it did highlight the potential for language issues. There's some very interesting people on that panel. Some of the answers to the questions were a bit random, <laughs> but it was heartening to see to see that there is stuff happening to help connect startups with China. The best part about it was meeting other attendees there. So while you know the stage talk was somewhat interesting. Really, it, yeah, everyone who went, I think, enjoyed the discussions after, the, the networking after. Um, and I think the presentations were, were good, but I found the most value in being able to talk to other people. Getting to talk to other startups to find out what they're doing and their journey was the interesting part for myself. For me, the vibe in that room was a lot like the vibe in Silicon Valley in the late 90s. There was such an excitement that things were happening. People wanted openly to help other people, to pitch their ideas. There was a real vibe that, that this was the place to be. And to find out about accelerators like Hacks, we made a decision very early on to not want to take funding or give up ownership of the business. So the whole accelerator idea 
while it's good for some businesses, was not something that we chose to do. Associated with that are usually high costs. No one does this stuff for free because they feel like they really, they really want to help you out and be your friend. You know, they're not doing it for that. They're doing it for money. One of the people on the panel was very direct in saying that you know coming to China is hard, and he was you know very pessimistic about any kind of Western people who are able to crack that market. And you know, to be fair, I think he probably does have a point. If not just a cautionary tale, I don't think it's impossible, but it, it is a it is a really different market, and I think um, going into that market without support would be really tricky. From after the tour, I think manufacturing in China is is really accessible, but that does doesn't mean that cracking the Chinese market is so. One of the brief presentations during that event was Aura 3D, which was an Australian startup by a gentleman named Raul. And I think it was the thing that the innovation tour participants were most interested in. We saw a really impressive presentation for a 3D scanner. Look what we can do. We've got this amazing person who's come along and we've helped him bring his idea to market. So I'm Rahul, I'm one of the co-founders of ER3D. What we basically two years ago in, a, in our garage in Blacktown, there's a few people in Sydney who know, we had to go buy one of these scanners. So we went down to one of the you know, uh, engineering uh, shops, for lack of a better word, and the guy said, it's $8,000. And I said, gee, oh, what? It's $8,000 as an engineer, it doesn't make sense. So we looked deeper into it, and we found out that it's, it's while there is a lot of technology built into this, it's essentially based on a very simple phenomenon. It has a camera, which is what you can see on the edges. It has some kind of light projector, which is projecting light, and it has a very powerful computer that processes all the data and gives you a 3D file. Seeing some photos of his early prototypes versus the final product, there was a very big progression in the design and how polished the final product looks to be. It was a company that wasn't originally intending to build such a product. They had an itch they needed to scratch and worked out that they, they had a really innovative way of 3D scanning using a mobile phone as, as the primary scanning element. And effectively he found a way of getting an attachment for a smartphone that you could then take a photo on the fancy camera that then would then give you a 3D image of thing. So very low cost uh, 3D scanner that competes very well with, with products that might ch might cost more than $7,000. And this means that this um, technology just becomes hugely accessible. And I'm definitely interested to, to see some reviews because I would be very interested in purchasing it if the reviews show that it's a good product. So he found people to make the metal parts, found people to make the plastic parts, found people to assemble it all for him. And his product is commercially available now. So he's, he's done the journey as well from the you know, first prototype I made in my backyard to a product that's now mass manufactured in Shenzhen and he was a, a poster boy for Austrade.